ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد ولا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد يا إخوة في الله يا أخوات في الله بارك الله فيكم جميعا as my brother here al akh abu musa better known to the community ibrahim dani yesterday and today he was in a conference in st catharines and i was there yesterday this whole time slot belongs to my brother but he likes to share the football because it's a team game he asked me to come and make a presentation with him so i like to thank my brother for that inshallah ta'ala we begin bi idni ta'ala with the ayah from the book of allah in surah al-anam as allah ta'ala goes on to say وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَسِّلُ الْآيَاتِ وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ Allah, the glorified, the magnified, He went on to say, and this is how we explain the signs so that the path of the criminals becomes clear. So this is the ayah today, بِإِنِّي اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And as Hudayfa رضي الله تعالى عنه, he asked the Prophet ﷺ a bunch of questions. And he wanted to say, كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْعَلُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ أَنَ الشَّرْ أَنَ خَيْرْ وَكُنْتُ أَسْعَلُهُ أَنَ الشَّرْ مُخَافَةَ أَنْ يُدْرِكَنِي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم في أخرجه مسلم وبخاري ولف تختلف that this hadith is in Bukhari and it's in Sahih Muslim and the wording is a little bit slightly different he went on to say that the people used to ask the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم about good but I used to ask him about evil for fear that I would fall into it. So we see, Ya Ikhwani, Ya Akhwati, me and the brother, we don't have our BA in Kufr and Shirk. We don't have our BA and Master's degree in Shirk and Kufr. But we have, we had a PhD in Kufr and Shirk, which is permanent head damage. And Allah Ta'ala, He guided us from that Kufr to Al Islam. And this is why we find. That Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he went on to say, and there's different meanings and there's different loves, مَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفَ الْجَاهَلِيَّةِ لَمْ يَعْرِفَ Islam, Which means that you will never truly understand a jahiliyyah until you understand Islam. Or you will never truly understand Islam until you understand its opposite, a jahiliyyah. And as the poet goes on to say, لَا تَعْرْمُ الشَّيْءِ حَتَّى تَعْلْمُ دِدُّهُ You will never understand something until you understand its opposite. So me and the brother were in all kinds of darkness that you guys never seen in your lifetime. And I was explaining to the brothers upstairs earlier today, where I was reading an article about Jay-Z the rapper, and he was saying, you young kids, you now respect the person who gets shot like 50 cent. He was shot eight times, he lived, therefore he called himself bulletproof. So his record sales go up in the sky. Where we lived in a time that we respect the shooter. Those are the times that we used to live in. All that stuff, ya ikhwan, it's madness. So today, bi'ini lai ta'ala, we're going to talk about qata' tariq adu'an fi asabir. Which is betterly known, or as we're going to say this, so that the Pakistani brothers, they know, that the word for gangster is gundar. Then gundar. The name for gangster in Somalian is and I hope my pronunciation is right, forgive me because I'm not Somali. Morian. <laughs> or, is that right? Or Giri. Or Dada. But you see, I don't think they translate it as good as the Jamaicans translate it. We call the man who are under shot him the rude boy done Dada. <laughs> or the new school, the new school in Jamaica, they call the man the top shutter. <laughs> or they call a man like my old man here, him the original gangster. <laughs> you see, so all this stuff, ya ikhwan, the highway robbers, the hold up in the stick up man, or the person who's stealing the money from the people, this has become something that is new to the kids. And as we know, Laysa Tahta Shams Jadid, there's nothing new under the sun. Me and the brother, we can't say we've seen everything in the East and the West, but most of the stuff that you guys are involved with, we already seen it already. It's just a rerun to us with some other actors in it. Also, a tariq yu'idu nafsahu, that history, it repeats itself. So many of us, we know of the story of Malcolm X, rahimahullah ta'ala, and we love him. And he had influence on our life.
But let us now, inshallah ta'ala, go to the Amr Atiq, to the people who live before us. And we're taken from the book, Asya Alam al by Imam al-Dhahabi. And we're going to read a little bit of the story of one of my favorite people from the past. His name, rahmatullah alayhi, was Fudail ibn Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala. And the seerah goes on to say, كان فضيل ابن عياد شاطرا يقطع طريق بين أبي ورد وصرخس. which basically means that فضيل ابن عياد رحمة الله عليه he was شاطرا يقطع طريق بين أبي ورد وصرخس. that he was the mastermind. he was the crafty, experienced, sophisticated highway robbing, jacking, stealing, killing, murdering man. that's what he was gifted at. but we find here that it goes on to say. وَكَانَ سَبَبُ تَوْبَتِهِ أَنَا عَاشِقَ جَارِيَةً فَبَيْنَ هُوَ يَرْتَقِ الْجِدَارٍ إِلَيْهِ إِذَا سَمِعَ تَالِيًا Which says that the reason that he embarked upon his tawbah or he made his tawbah was that he went to go chop one of his honeys. One of the beautiful honeys. And as he was climbing up the ladder or going over the roof, he heard somebody from the Muslims recite this ayah, Alam ya, alam ya lilladheena amanu an taghsha qulubahum. Has not the time arrived for the believers that their hearts should be affected and humbled by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And we say for all you young kids that think that you're hardcore and you think that you've seen something in the street. My brother, MashaAllah, may Allah forgive him for his sins and me for my sins. We've seen so much stuff that we can write volumes about kufr and shirk. And that's why we have the experience to come and talk to you guys. So if you see my brother here or you see me, most of the time we've, done, done, we've been through all of that stuff before. So come and ask us, hey brother, what about that? What about that? And my brother, he's a lot older than me. He's seen more stuff than me. And you see his beard, mashallah, is a little bit more gray. He's much more wiser than me. He has more tact, more understanding, more, more farsight than I have. More well, patience. And more patience. <laughs> but we work together, well, alhamdulillah. So we find that, we find that the great poet, he went on to say, and inshallah ta'ala, I'm still working on my Arabic. I never got a degree from Medina University, inshallah ta'ala. Yet. But I hope Allah allows me to do that one day, inshallah. inshallah. He said, Araftu ashar la li shar lakin li tawqihi wa man la yu'rif ashar yaq'u fihi. Or kama qal ashar, ashair. Learn evil, learn evil, not for the sake of it, but rather to avoid it. For he who does not know evil, then he'll fall into it. So many of the youth, they're getting involved in all kinds of things. My brother is a little bit different than me. People call his phone late in the night, he answers the phone and he helps them out. I shut my phone off at 11 o'clock at night and I'm like, Salaamu Alaikum. That's it. I try to help the people when I can. The brother, he's more helpful than me. MashaAllah Ta'ala. May Allah bless us all, inshaAllah. So we find your Ikhwan. And inshaAllah Ta'ala, I'm going to conclude very soon because it is my brother's workshop. خياركم في الجاهلية خياركم في الإسلام إذا فقحوا أو قام قال صلى الله عليه وسلم وأخرجه مسلم وبخاري أن authority Abu Huraira the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that the best of you in the days of ignorance will become the best of you in Islam if Allah Taala if He gives you understanding of the religion so we find an ya ikhwan that some of our young youth and the brother can tell you so many stories they're carrying weapons. They're trying to carry BB guns and knives and swords. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ حَمِلَ عَلَيْنَا سِلَّحْ فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا أَوْ قَمَ قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَخْرَجُهُ مُسْلَمْ He said, the one who carries a weapon or points a weapon against us is not from us. So we find, ya ikhwan, and inshallah ta'ala, I have two more hadith to relate, and then that's it, inshallah ta'ala, that we find for all the brothers and all the sisters that are caught up in this stuff, or they want to involve them stuff in this stuff. Remember this hadith on the authority. And this hadith is in Sahih, Al-Jami' al sagira wa Ziyada. Also it's collected in Ibn Sa'd. And also in Urwa Ghalil by Shaykh Al-Albani. And the hadith is Sahih with the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, Al-Islamu yujibu ma kana qablahu. That Islam erases away everything that came before it. So all the things that you've done before, if you start to practice the religion, you make tawbah to Allah, it'll be erased. And we leave you brothers with the last story. 
where we find in Bukhari the story of Rajulu Qata'a Tis'atan wa Tis'ina Nafsan. The story of the man, think about this now. The story of the man that killed more than 99 people. Do we know anybody on the earth that's walking, that's killed 99 people, and they're still walking? Is there anybody here who can qualify? Just, just wondering, sir. Oh, this brother got his hand up. No, no, you're too young, brother. Not yet. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know somebody maybe? Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> so we know, ya ikhwan, that this man, he made tawbah to Allah Ta'ala for the evil that he did. After a long story, you can find this story in Riyadh al-Saliheen, you can find it in Bukhari, and you can find it in a Muslim. If he can make tawbah to Allah, and Allah forgave him and let him go into the paradise, then it's hopeful that all of us, هذا ما عندي وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت ورستافروك وتوب إليك إن شاء الله تعالى I like to introduce my brother Akhana, Abu Musa, Ibrahim, Ibn Charles, Downey, حفظه الله تعالى Ibn Karl. Ibn Karl? Karl. Oh, Ibn Karl, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. May, yeah. may, may Allah allow us all, inshallah ta'ala, to enjoy from the brothers' workshop, inshallah. And again, I'd like to thank the Qa'imin of the brothers for allowing us to partake in this presentation. And I'd like to thank my brother for giving me a portion of his time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum khair. You want to say uh, the microphone. I got the mic on here. Okay. Audhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I'm happy to be here and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause us to take this time to be a benefit. Uh, I came here, wallahi, I came here right from the masjid in St. Catherine's where we had over there three days with the Muslim youth. Unbelievable. The group over there is unbelievable. The brothers and sisters, they're doing some amazing things to be able to organize themselves. And really, we were, we were so pleased with the effort that they put in that we didn't want to leave. But I have to say, I have to come here to you and I have to tell them that I have to separate myself just to come here to you, just so I can share some information with you. And as you know, and many of you understand very well, that we're working with the Muslim inmates from 1992. It's not yesterday or last week or something we started. We started a long time ago. And it's been very busy for us. Very, very busy. Now, let me give you an idea about a few things. But actually, I'm going to ask you to bear with me because when we were in, uh, when we were in St. Catharines, mashallah, the brothers, they were very pleased with what we presented to them. Because we presented workshops every day, three or four workshops, talking with the youth. Many of you have been to the workshops, you've attended the programs we have and whatever have you. And our brother, Abu Shahada, Abu Abdullah, he came now to, uh, to come now yesterday to the masjid and he gave a very fine presentation. And alhamdulillah, he talked about the replacements. He talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the people, the Muslims, the believers, they're not coming now to actually practice and do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala require us to do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces. us. He take the deen from you and he give to somebody else. He makes somebody else come on the spot to be that person who's going to believe and do some good. Anybody want to join for that one? I don't think so. So, we have to be careful for that. Very important point. But the brothers and the sisters there, they were very pleased. And they asked me on their behalf to give uh, some recognition to our brother Abu Shahada for that. So therefore I have this uh, token of their appreciation and esteem. This is, uh, I don't know, I'm going to pull it out of my pocket here. This is from the, uh, the third, uh, third Youth Camp 2007. An appreciation for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with the youth of uh, Masjid al Nur, St. Catharines. They asked me to give him this, and we want you to recognize that, and to give our brother respect behind this, because he works very hard, and mashallah, we invite him to make sure that we share. So, Jazak Lakar. Allahu Akbar. Now, I want to get to my program, and I don't want to waste your time. As you know, we don't like to waste your time, and we don't allow you to waste ours. Jazak Lakar for being here today, and we're very happy. Do you know why I'm happy here? Do you know why I'm happy to see you here? Anybody there? Anybody could tell me? Go ahead, brother. Why are we happy to see you here? You can say me? Who can say something? Okay, go ahead. Because you're good. Okay? This is a good place to meet, right? Is it, is it any better place we have? There's no better place we have. We, we can agree on that. There's no confusion about that. Okay, now, here's the thing. I'm very happy to meet you here because, again, we're going to the different jails, we're going to the different shelters, we're going to the homeless shelters, we're going to the drug rehab, we're going to the different places, and guess what we're finding in all of these places? We're finding the Muslims. Some of you, you're going to these places. 
Some of you, you carry your families and you have to go to these places. Some of you are coming out to get in serious problems and creating all kinds of difficulty. Is that true or false? Right? But it's not only here. And I don't want you to feel bad. I, I, I mean, I don't want you to feel good that you're doing some bad things or something. But I don't want you to feel bad because last week in last Juma, I spent the Juma in Montreal. I was there for one week. Guess what happened? I'm in Montreal. Guess what the problems they have there too? The Muslims are involved with guns. The Muslims are involved with drugs. The Muslims are involved with crime. The Muslims are doing crazy things. Guess what happened? The many other people. We have eight guys from the Muslim community there. They went to jail last week. No, two weeks ago. And the people still don't know what to do. And they're asking me, brother, you can come and live with us? I said, no, I have to come here to, I have my family here, we have our community here. But I'll teach you. If you want, I'll give you a little time to teach. So we teach when we go there. So guess what happened? We go down last week to, uh, uh, um, we go last week to, uh, to uh, Quebec, and we find this condition. We come back over here, guess what happened? Over now in St. Catharines, about one month ago, they have a similar situation. A whole group of guys, Muslims, what happened? They get caught up in a whole thing with the gangs. They get caught up in a whole thing with the drugs. They get caught up with the whole thing with the violence. Guess what? They're all in jail now. So guess what happened? Last week, this week, I'm sorry, this week they just passed. Guess what happened? In Scarborough, if you know this place over in Scarborough, there's people who are going in Scarborough, guess what happened to them? They're also going what? To get caught up and caught in the jail. We have five guys. So it's from Quebec, we see eight guys. We go to St. Catharines, they have eight guys. We go to Scarborough, we see five guys, and those are the only guys we know about. Those are the guys we know about. So, there's a big problem. It's not a small thing anymore. We have more Muslims going to jail than ever before. So, for us to meet you here, for us to come now to take time with you and to be able to share with you some information that can help you think. We cannot tell you what to think. We can't. We've been trying for many years to try to get people to think. We can't tell you what to think. It's not going to work. We know it. But what we can do is we can help you to think. Are you willing to work with us for that? Because if you're willing to work with us, wallahi, we're going to start now and we have a very short program and we're going to try to make it very impactful, but we wanted to benefit you. So give me one second to go to the board and we'll have to share some. Now I hope you don't mind. For me, I'm a person who, I'm a very visual person. And if you want to know why I'm visual, because they say that a, a picture speaks a thousand words. Now, some of you have seen this before, and if you have, then please bear with us. And if you haven't seen it, good for you to be here now. Everything that we do, and all of our training, it starts with this. Anybody know what this is? A line. Simple line, isn't it? It doesn't seem like such a big deal. It's huge. But if you just look at it, it just seems like a simple thing. Let me explain to you what happened. There's two groups of people you're going to run into, and two groups of people we have consistently run into. The one group is below the line, and there's the next group above the line. You with me so far? Here's what the people do below the line. They do what? Blame. They blame. Who do they blame? They blame anyone, they blame everyone. Okay? Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? How bad is it? Yeah. Very bad, yes? Okay. So, let us look at the blaming because you can hear it from their, you can hear it from their mouth and you can see it from their action. Everybody can do this, right? And point your finger and blame it on somebody else? Is that right? Everybody, every, you ever do that? Okay, don't answer, right? <laughs> okay, so now, when you have one finger pointing out, what happened? You have three fingers pointing back. Where are those fingers pointing? At you. At you. They're asking to you. You have to take responsibility for you. If you take responsibility, you're in a better position. Let me show you what happened if you take responsibility. You can live over here, and you can do this. You can do what? You can learn. You can decide to learn. So, we're in St. Catharines and the people are asking me, the young people are asking me, say, brother, what do you do, how can you get over a condition where you did a sin and, you, and you, you don't feel like you're getting forgiveness? How can you do that? We tell you, if you did a sin, you did something you know is wrong, you have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. To G-E-T, you have to A-S-K. To get, you have to ask. Is that right? Don't think that you're just going to sit there, you don't have to do anything. But is the only to ask is enough? No. We say what? You have to come now to put some effort behind it. If you did a bad deed, you have to cover your bad deed with a good deed. This is more activity for you to be able to make, have something in your heart that make you feel like you did something good. So let's talk about this now. You see, those people who continue to blame, what happened to them? They become very weak. Why? Because they're transferring their responsibility to somebody or something else. 
And as long as they do that, guess what happens to them? They become very weak. And when they become very weak, guess what happens? They become... What's that? Lame. lame. What does it mean to be lame? To me lame, that means you can't help yourself and you won't help anyone else. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's an absolutely terrible thing. Okay? But those people who decide they want to learn, guess what happens? They get to? Okay, who wants to earn? Anybody? Anybody with me on this? Alright, so here's the deal. Right? We have to discuss how things are getting so messed up. Our topic today is what? Gangsters before Islam. When we're seeing the brothers going to the jail, there's a jail right down the road here. Right? There's another jail in St. Catharines. There's another one down in Hamilton. We're going to the jails in different places all around. And guess what we're finding? We're finding many of the people, they love to do this. And they don't like to do this. So guess what? They're keeping themselves in a bad condition. Okay? So here's the thing. We need to be able to help you understand how things get so messed up. Now I have two things I need to show you and share with you for that. Okay, can you be patient with me for this? Okay, let me start here. I need to show you by showing you what's called an event. Around the event, we're going to put the Asians. We'll put the Africans. Uh, we'll put the uh, Hispanics. Hispanics, Spanish people, okay? Uh, we're going to put the uh, Europeans, okay? Uh, we're going to put the um, native people, and we're going to put the Arabs. Okay? So, this is what we have. So, now what we have is we have an event. Okay? I just need to set the foundation with you. I just need you to understand what we're talking about, and we need to have some clear understanding. Everybody understand what we have here? We have different groups of different nations all around the world. We have these groups. Over here, what we have in this event. From that event, we want to take something of understanding. Okay? Now, the event by itself is just the event. It's just the event. It's not good or bad, except that you look at it from different perspective. If you look at a say event, let's take the Second World War. We want to give you historic reference so you don't misunderstand. Let's take the Second World War. What happened in the Second World War? The Americans were bombed by the Japanese. Is that true? Right? They bombed Pearl Harbor. When they did that, the Americans attacked them back, and what did they do? They bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima. It's fact. History. Okay? So, here's the thing. If you look at it from the Asian, which is the Japanese, you hear one story. If you look at it from the, uh, from the Europeans, you hear another story. You see, same thing, same story, two different things. When we look at another issue, we can look at the Africans coming now and being taken into slavery. The story from that is a clear issue, but when you come in now to listen to the Europeans, it's a different story than when you hear with the Africans. The Africans, they almost got destroyed. People in West Africa, many pieces in Africa, they almost got destroyed. They lost their culture, they lost their religion, they lost their identity, everything gone. And they're brought over here and they're put into slavery of the worst kind. So they don't even have a chance to be able to find themselves and they get lost. Even my people, they're like this. His people, they're like that. You see? So your people, you're not, you didn't have to go through that, alhamdulillah. But here's the reality. When you go through this, you have one story. Over here, they tell another story. They say, no, we had to civilize this savage black man in Africa. We had to do that. And that's what they're doing, you see? So this is the creation that they're doing. Everybody with me so far? You understand how things get messed up? Let's take one more example so it's clear. If you take the native people, and the native people, when the Europeans came over from Europe, they came over from England and Scotland and places, when they came over there, they went to America. When they came over to America, what happened to the native people? They slaughtered them. They killed the buffalo. They brought them disease, and they did all kinds of things. Even till today, the native people are still on reservations. Even if you look at what's going on, even in Australia, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Now, these native people, they have one story. The Europeans, they have another story. You understand me? Very important. Let's look at how things get messed up for us. We find three things. This is, this is. I know I'm not a very good drawer, so don't, don't get upset with me, okay? This, this is a person, okay? This is a person. Let's say that this is the person's head, and in the head is the brain. Fair enough? 
Here's what we have. We're going to divide this in three. Hmm? Now on this part here, this is where the person has what they call animalistic. This is where the person acts like an animal. This is instinctual. This is where they come now to, to do the aggressive thing, to be able to go out there and fight and to be able to survive and do all of that. Do you understand? Do you ever get to a point where you feel very aggressive and you know you have to fight back? Do you ever get like that? Sometimes you get like that? Right. So this is what happened. Over here, you have over here what's called the intelligence. This is the intelligent area over here. This is where you're thinking. This is where you start to reason, you start to focus. Over here, this is where you have the spiritual. Okay? This is where you have your spiritual development and your spiritual connection. I just want to break it down to you to help you understand something. So here's what happened. The guys who are coming now to get themselves in a situation where they get into the animalistic behavior, where they get into that instinctual behavior, that aggressive mode, where they have to go out there and they have to be really aggressive to survive in the society. What happens now, they go out and they get caught in a situation where they have to do that. It's supposed to only be temporary. You're supposed to be able to shut it off. But what happened? You don't shut it off. Now you go home, you get aggressive with your wife. Now you go home, you get aggressive with your parents. If you know how much we're talking in the last little while about the children becoming aggressive with their parents and disobeying their parents. Many of the young people, the young Muslims who are coming now to disobey their parents, guess what happened to them? They end up in jail. They end up in jail because they get here. They get to this aggressive level where they're just only thinking about being aggressive. I don't have to listen to you. You don't tell me what to do. I'm my own person. I'm my own man. I can do whatever I want. You see, when you start to come like this, now you start to really get in trouble. But you don't know it. You don't know it. You think everything is okay. But what you're doing is you're planting the seed of destruction for yourself. Let me tell you why I say that. You see, what happens is, and this is our experience, what we know for certain is this, is that when you disrespect your parents, when you disrespect your mother and your father, your uncles and the other people of your family, here's what happened. You are now coming now to disrespect yourself. And you disrespect yourself because you forgot about Allah. And if you forget about Allah, guess what happened to you? Allah make you forget yourself. And you destroy yourself with your own hand. You don't have to worry about the guys in the neighborhood. You don't have to worry about the guys down the street. You can point your finger all day at the Kafirs. And guess what? They're, they're, you're below the line and they're above the line because they're learning what it takes to move on. You're still stuck blaming somebody else. So it's a big fitna. It's, a big, it's not a small thing. It's widespread for our community. So. There's many young brothers here, we've seen them turn it around. I, I, I'm looking at some of their faces right now, and they did a good job. They really did. They turned things around. They made a better effort to do better things, and to get better results from themselves and from their effort. Right? So we say, MashaAllah, may Allah bless you in that. But it's not over. Why? Because we still have a lot of work to do. There's many guys who don't understand. So, when you get to the animalistic point, it's supposed to be temporary. If you don't turn it off, if you don't control it, if you need it, it's, it's there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it for you to use it. But if you don't turn it off, now you're in a problem. Because now you have to control that thing. You can't go to school and do that, because they'll put you in a problem. You can't go home and do it. You can't take it with your wife and your family, your mom and your dad. You're supposed to turn it off and control it. So you're supposed to use your intelligence to do that. And if you have the problem using your intelligence to do that, you're supposed to rely on your spiritual development. You're supposed to seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that circumstance of control and benefit yourself through the fasting and those things that will help you get yourself under control so you don't go too far. Because we have too many young people going too far. Anybody have any questions for this? Because I have something else, but I want to make sure we understand what's going on here. Is there any questions? No? Okay, mashallah. Let me finish with some, one other thing. Okay, actually, you know what? I have one question before we go. Uh, I have three words here. I have bad, good, best. Can everybody see that? Bad, good, and best. Okay? I'm going to ask you a question. Who is the enemy of good? I'm sorry? Bad. bad. Is that clear? Yes. The enemy of bad, of, of good is bad. Okay, we're good, right? Okay, so if the enemy of good is bad, who is the enemy of best? Uh, uh huh? Oh, wait, oh, oh, wait now, so wait now, so wait. Oh, 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 we're confused. Oh, you're confused. Oh, wait now, hold on. Good, bad. Bad, good. Oh, okay. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. 
hold on. Okay, you got an answer? Who's got an answer? Hold on, hold on. Go. Good. Good. What is the enemy of best? Good. If, if bad is the enemy of good, then? Best. Best is the, the, the good is the enemy of bad. So, as Muslims, as Muslims, I'm asking you, I'm asking you, are you guys behaving bad in a bad way? Some of you. You know when you're behaving bad, right? You know the difference between good and bad. And you're behaving like that, and you know it, right? So when you're behaving bad, what is it that causes you to come to good? How? How? Hey, how? You're supposed to do what? You're supposed to do what? Your best. You're supposed to do your best. You see, we as Muslims, we're supposed to be striving to do our best. We're not supposed to be just trying to do okay, we're just striving to do good. If you're going to school, we want you to do your best. If you're coming to give a lecture in the masjid, if you're coming out to contribute to the community, do your best. We don't want anybody just coming along thinking they could just carry on a little ways and just take it easy. No, everybody should be pushing themselves to the maximum effort they can do to be their best. You see, this is how we're going to change things. When we understand that over here, this is where we want to be. Now, I want you to relate this to this. You understand? If we want to be bad, this is where we can be bad. This is where the people are bad. This is where they come now to be animalistic. They become aggressive. They become violent. Right here. Right here. Why? Because this is the thing that comes now to be a good thing, but then they turn it into a bad thing. When they want to change it, they have to re recognize and intelligently understand that this is wrong. This is not going to get them a good result. And when they do that now, they can also relate to the good that they have. And the best thing that they can do is come now to bring in their spirit. Let their spiritual development come to have an impact. Let them remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let them remember the responsibility they have as Muslims and be able to go forward from there. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Let me finish with one other thing for you. Because again... Islam is about solutions. Brothers, we need to know and we need to remember that Islam is about solutions. And as Muslims, in this society and anywhere we're going, this is about solutions. This is our responsibility to bring these people solutions, to be able to invite the creation back to the worship of the Creator. Let me show you something I think is really important for all of us. This is what we call the Muslim Personal Success Triangle. What's it called? Muslim personal success triangle. It's very important if we can understand this. Now, on the outside, it's got three elements. It's got three elements. What do we have? We have IC, which is for internal communication. We have EC, which stands for external communication. We have TK, which stands for technical know-how, not technical knowledge. We have enough technical knowledge. We've got tons of it. But if we don't apply the technical knowledge, it doesn't benefit us. We have to have a way to apply it. So we want to talk about this now. When we start talking about internal communication, who are, we talking, who are you talking to? You talking to anybody else? No. You're just talking to yourself. Do you ever do this? When you get it, you know, you put on a new jalabiya, maybe you're getting ready for eat or something, you got on a new kufi, you know, you're feeling, you're stretched out, you took a shower, you know, you're feeling a little, you know, you're feeling a little bit nice and whatever. You put on that thing, man, you look in the mirror, man, you say, man, you're looking good. You do that? You guys did that. I know some of the brothers say, huh? Yeah, I know. Anyway, here's the thing, right? When you're doing that, what are you doing? This is internal communication. Is there anybody else there? No, it's you. You're talking to yourself. Do you ever do something and you come now to think, you know, that was really dumb? Yeah. Maybe you made a mistake, you forgot the little details on a test or something, and you knew it, but guess what? You didn't write it down. You didn't write it down, you didn't think about it, and that little detail could have got you past, but you made one mistake and you, you said, oh, that was real stupid, I knew that one. You ever do that? Of course you did. You see? Who are you talking to? You're talking to yourself. This is not you talking to anyone else. It's not about anybody else. This is about you. So now when you have this condition of talking to yourself, now your internal communication is going to automatically affect something very important. Something we need to talk a lot about. You know what that is? Self-esteem. You know self-esteem? Anybody could give me a definition of self-esteem? Quickly. Anyone could offer us something? Brothers. Huh? Highest level? Self-esteem. What is self-esteem? Go. Building your confidence. confidence. Self-esteem. How many people here feel very confident about themselves as Muslims? How many people here feel that the effort they're making right now is going to help them to get to Jannah? Anybody? What do you want you guys over here? You guys are sleeping? You don't want to go to Jannah? You don't want to go, brother? Brother's looking at me like, I'm here, brother. Here. Masha'Allah. Yeah, you. Yeah, uh -huh. You want to go to Jannah or no? 
Oh no, brother, put the chicken wing down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Stop going <laughs> Watch right. Allah, listen here. If you want to go to Jannah, you have to want to do it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. But the thing is, you have to get busy. So let's talk about some of the other things that affect your internal communication, which affects your self-esteem, how you feel about yourself. We have to talk about external communication. External communication comes with somebody telling you, you're a very handsome guy. Somebody's telling you, you're a very stupid kid. Somebody's telling you, you're not going to amount to anything. Somebody's telling you, you're always getting in trouble. And so on like this. Okay guys, you got you to chill with all of that. Okay? Or the rude the, boy done done as will come and get you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Alright? So, you have to come now to understand that external communication can have a big impact and how we deal with things and how it comes to us and how it actually, uh, uh, how we deal with, how we play it out. Okay? It's going to be up to us. So the external communication is crucial. So, when somebody's talking to you good, you get good results. You feel good. When they're talking to you bad, it impacts you in a bad way. Let's talk about how if a person has low self-esteem, does it, is it possible for them to have low self-esteem? They don't have a good opinion of themselves. Can they talk to somebody a good way? No, it's not going to happen most times. They're going to have a bad opinion and they're going to do this. So this is why we see many of the young people, they're coming now to talk back to their parents. Why? Because inside of themselves, they don't feel very high. Inside of themselves, they don't feel their worth. They don't understand their value. And this is why they can talk so easily back to the mother and father and disrespect them. Because they think that it's something coming from the society of the people thinking, Oh, this is make me big. This makes me strong. I punked my mom. I punked my dad. I'm in charge. No, you're not in charge. Actually, you've done yourself a great harm, but maybe you just don't know. So let's talk about technical know-how. Because technical know-how is how you talk to yourself and how you talk to others and how you let them talk to you. It's a technical thing, and it's all about communication. Now, I really need you guys to pay attention to this next point because this is a crucial point. Understand this, is that inside of here, we have some issues. We know, we know, and again, if you understand, we're working with people in various difficult situations. Social difficulties is massive. So here's the thing, we know that when somebody has this, when somebody has this, has what? Can you guys see that? When somebody has tough work, we can help them. And if they don't have it, and they want to build it, we can help them. But if they don't have it, and they don't want to build it, guess what? They're disqualified. We don't spend any time with them. We leave the door open for them, they can come later when they're ready, but really it's a waste of time, because taqwa is the key to all of these issues. If you have taqwa, you can't talk back to your mother and your father. You can't. Impossible. You know, I'll tell you a story. Briefly, my mom, she took Shahada on May the, I'm uh, sorry, on uh, February the 8th, the same day I came back from Hajj. Many of you know that, right? From the time I was Muslim until now, I didn't talk back to my mom. Okay? I didn't talk back to her at all. Right? My dad, about five months ago, he took Shahada. Right? That's after 24 years of Dawah. We're giving him Dawah, 24 years. Not a couple days, a couple weeks. No, years and years and years we're giving him Dawah. And guess what? He finally come to Islam. Was it because we're giving him the dawah? No. He's looking at our behavior. He's looking at the respect we're showing him continuously. He's looking at the effort we're making to come now to please him and to be able to stay close to him. Even though he's kafir, even though he's eating pork, even though he's drinking alcohol, even though he's doing things we absolutely want nothing to do with, we continue to stay close to him and try to bring him to Islam. So now he become Muslim. So alhamdulillah. So we don't tell you, we don't tell you to come now and just rely on your relationship with your parents, but we tell you to come now to serve them, to honor them, to respect them. What they give you, you can't give them back. They give you life, you can't give them life. They give you honor, you can't give them honor. They give you respect, you can't give it back. If you can't give it back, it's impossible. No matter what you can do, you can't pay them back for the, the kindness they gave you because they took care of you when you were sick and if they didn't take care of you, maybe you're going to die. They honored you and respected you and protected you. You owe them. You can't come now to disrespect that. A very important thing. So, how do we tell you all of that and tell you that this is connected? You see, if you have certain things within your taqwa, if you understand the elements of the taqwa, if you have it, then you'll go now before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a good heart, knowing that you tried your best. Let's look at one of the things you need. You need to have what's called fear. Kauf Allah. You need to have fear of Allah. Crucial. You need to fear Allah. You need to fear Allah more than you fear your mom and dad being upset. Allah has put it like this between you and your parents, 
that you should honor them and you should give them uh, service so that you enter Jannah by giving them service. You enter Jannah by helping them. SubhanAllah. And you will talk back to them. You're not supposed to say oof to them. But you come now and tell them, hey, be quiet, you don't tell me what to do. How can you say that? How can you think about this? No. You see, we have to come now to have exercise our taqwa and the fear of Allah. And if you really, really want to know something really important, let me share this with you. You should have this in abundance for Allah. You should have what? You should have love for Allah in abundance. Because every breath you take is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you blink, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you sneeze, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you wake up in the morning, gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you go to sleep at night, gift from Allah. If you drink, if you eat, if you travel, if you, whatever you do, anytime you do it, it's a gift from Allah. Because you can snatch it like that from you and it's all over. And then you go to be held accountable. Now, yesterday, we're in the masjid in St. Catharines, and the sisters, the women, the mothers, they're asking me a question. They said, brother, what can we do when our kids, they don't want to listen? What can we do when our kids are continually disobeying us, even after we have somebody talk to them? My advice, you know what I told them? I said, sister, the next time you're going out, they said, take the kids, you take them for a drive, I said, let's go get some chicken. You know, let's go get some chicken. Get them in the car. You're driving down the road. You know where the graveyard is? Get to the graveyard. <coughs> Stop right in front of the graveyard. Tell them, get out. Right in front of the graveyard. Doesn't matter, day or night. Get out. Get out and go to the graveyard. Now we need to talk. Because when you get to the graveyard, is anybody here think that they're going to live forever? No. Does everyone know that you're going to die and you're going to be held accountable for what you do? Yeah. Everybody. Is anybody here disagree with that? Nobody. Oh, brother, you got your hand? Oh, sorry. Asala. I'm just checking, man, because some people think they got this idea they can live forever. But usually we don't see that. So Anyway, since we all know we're going to die, is it possible for anyone to avoid the grave? Yeah. It's impossible, yes? Okay, so now, the question is this. Do you want to go to the grave in a good condition or a bad one? Good. I'm sorry? Good. I'm sorry? Good. Ah, good. Is that true? Yeah. Right, so now, here's the question. Now, here's a real test for you. Are the deeds that you're doing... The deeds that you're doing with your parents, with your brothers, with your sisters, with yourself. Are the deeds you're doing going to get you to the Jannah or is going to get you to another place? Maybe. Hmm. Ah. Yeah. Okay. You see? So, are your deeds good deeds or bad deeds? Most of the time. Most of the time good. Okay. So, that's why we're happy to talk to you. That's why we're glad to give you an opportunity to understand something. You see? Because now if you have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will make sure that you put in the strongest effort to be able to give all the love you can to your parents and to those people who you care for, and that care for you. We are giving you, we're giving you. There's brothers who built this masjid. They're not here. Some of them passed away. You know that. <coughs> but guess what? They passed away. But guess what? The masjid is not finished. It's not finished. You look, I'm asking you, look around. Is it finished? No. Is it finished? No. Where's our community center? Do we have one yet? No. The masjid is going to build us a community center. They're going to help us do that. So, are we finished working? No. no. But some of the responsibility is going to transfer to you. And you have to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough to be able to come and do it. The guys who are before you, you're sitting in their place. Why? Because they were standing on their shoulders taking advantage of what they contributed. Your contribution is coming up now. Your contribution is here. You have to do something. So, you have to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on your taqwa to love Him. But here's the thing, here's the thing. If you understand, one of the most important things we want to make sure you walk out of here with today is this. What is that? Hope. We want you to have hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you success in this life and give you success in the hereafter and He's going to cause us all to be among those people who are ambassadors of Islam. We're going to be people going out and telling the people about what's going on in life and how they can improve their life and come closer to Allah. How much time do I have left, brother? 50 minutes? 50 minutes? Okay, alright. Okay, um, I need to go through one last thing with you. Okay, and I left this for last because I think it's really the most important. Anyway, you guys understand this? What's the key element in all of this? Taqwa. Okay, what is Taqwa going to be based on that's going to give you the best result? Fear. Oh, you got that? Yeah. Cool, we're good to go. Okay guys, one last thing. Let's talk about how things get messed up. We need to really focus on this, okay? Here's the thing. University of Michigan, United States of America, 
1958, they did a study to be able to see and determine what were the, what were the things in society building the character of the young people. They want to know what it is that causes the young people to build their character. Let me show you what they listed. 1958, they listed family as number one. They listed school as number two. They listed um, church as number three. They didn't say religion. We don't say religion. Right? They listed peers as number four, meaning friends. And number five was TV, television. You understand these? Yes. Okay. Now, since we don't have much time, we're not going to be able to go into detail in each one. But can you understand how each one of these can have an impact on who you will become? And on who you are? Right? Okay. Let's look at something. 1980... The 1985, University of Michigan, United States of America, continued their study. Now, in their study, they were looking for the same thing. They were looking to see how these things came out 22 years later. Who thinks that it's the same thing? No. Okay, you don't think so? Okay, what's number one? Huh? What'd you say? School? What's the number one influence in 1980, 1985? TV? No, not yet. Okay, let me give it to you. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Okay. Peers made the number one. Family dropped down to number two. Um, uh, school dropped down to number three. And TV moved up to number four. Hold on. What happened to church? Good question. You see? Okay, so what happened to church? We want you to understand something. This is a very important point. The brother brought a very good point. What happened to church? This time it's been indicated that from 1964 to 1968 there was a petition to remove from the school system the Lord's Prayer. They want to remove God from the circumstance of education. They don't want you learning about God. Even up to today it's like that. So now what happened is, when they removed God, what happened now? They didn't replace it with anything. They didn't replace it with anything at all. So there's this big void. So there's all this confusion, there's all this misguidance, there's all this behavior that just doesn't fit with good character. So what happened is, they removed God. They removed the circumstance of saying that church, or the connection with church to God, is coming now to help the people build their character. It's not happening. You see, and this is the danger for us, because we're living in a society where they've removed it. This is their circumstance. We're living amongst them. And because we're living amongst them, this is going to have an influence with us. We have to be careful for this. But let's look at something else. We're looking at 1995. 1995, we get a different set of values. What do we have? We have peers going into number one. We have uh, TV moved up to number two. We have family moved down to number three. Now, school is gone. School is gone from the list. Now, I want, you, I want you to ask you to recognize something here. This is really important. Hold on. This is really important. Okay, guys? I need you to settle down. No fighting, fellas. Okay? Hold on. This is really important. What do we start with over here? Family. family. Okay? What do we have down here? Where's family now? Family. You see? So the people are not coming now to look at the family as something to be able to build their character. Is this good or bad? Family. How bad is it? Very bad. Very bad. You see? So they're not listening to the teachers. Now they're not listening to the families. Now they don't, who are they going to listen to? They're going to listen to their friends. They're going to listen to the TV. These are the influences. So let's skip forward right now and let's go over to 2007. Where are we now? We got peers, still number one. TV is right up here. But now we have a latecomer. We have a thing called computers. Computers are coming in now. Computers are coming in to be an issue. You see? Right. So, now, let me ask you. Okay? I'm going to finish with this. If you'll be patient with me, I just want to finish with this, okay? Are these the values that we have as Muslims? No. Are these the values we have as Muslims? No. Okay. Let us talk now about what it is we value. If we're talking about character development, we're talking about 2007... And beyond. Okay? What are we talking about now? What is the first thing? What is... Oh, guys, hold on. Tell us, please. This is really important. I'm going to finish here in just a few minutes. I'm done. You guys can go and play and hang out and do all your stuff. Really important. Guys, what is the most important thing 
What is the most important thing for us to develop our character? We're choosing now. We're not going by what these people said is their standard. This is their standard. This is what they say. We don't have to say this. We don't have to accept this. We just have to know that that's what their influences are. What's our main influence in building our character? Huh? Religion. Does anybody disagree? Go ahead, brother. The mosque is religion. Quran. Religion. Family. Okay, we're going to get to that. Prayer. Religion. Anybody else? Go. Huh? These? Yes. Taqwa. Okay? Hold on. Okay, guys, here's the thing. Let me finish. Hold on. Here's the thing. Okay, can we all agree? Now, I want us to agree on this. This is important we agree. Can we all agree that Islam is the most important thing for us to develop our character? Yes or no? Everybody who agree, please raise your hand. Okay, just as an indication that it's true. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Islam is number one. Okay, what's number two? What's, what's number two? Huh? Family. How about family? Can we agree that family should be number two? Family should be number two. So we're going to put family. Okay, hold on, we're going to get to that. Okay, what should be number three? Sorry? School. Everybody agree? School number three? School? Okay. Okay, what's number four? Huh? Peers. Peers, friends, number four. Okay? Yes, brother. Exactly. Okay. Alright, so, hold on, guys. Settle down, settle down. Okay, let's work together. We're almost finished. Go. Peers, should we have good friends? Should we have good friends? Should our friends be people who are reminding us about Allah? Reminding us about the deen? For me, I love Abu Shahada. Why? He always reminds me about the deen. I have my days up, I have my days down, he reminds me. He has his days up, he has his days down, I remind him. We're going back and forth like this. How many of us we do that with each other? You see, these are the people who are supposed to be your friends. This is what we're supposed to do. So number four, we're going to put as friends. Okay? Peers. Peers. Exactly. Peers. Okay. Now, what do we have as number five? If we're going to take five things. TV? TV? Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Community? Huh? Media? It should be an influence for us? No. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yo. Okay, calm down, calm down. I have a question. I have a question. Hold on. Take time, take time. I have a question. I have a question. Hold on. Hold on. Take time. I have a question. Guys, please, answer this question for me. Answer this question for us. Okay? If, if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us here to give guidance to the people, if He sent us here to give guidance to the people, if we're doing that job, we're going to get good results, right? What happens if we don't do that job? We get bad results. So if we're not giving dawah to those people, they're giving dawah to us, and we're moving away from those things that are going to give us the good success. Okay? So we, can we agree that dawah, dawah, dawah to Islam should be on the list of things we need to make a priority to build our character. We need to be talking to people about Islam, inviting the people towards Islam, making it something that's important, making it something we're committed to. Give the poor people money, sure. That's part of the dawah. Okay, so, okay, let's just recap. We're going to recap right now. We're just going to regroup. Okay, guys, just bear with me. Two minutes, that's it. Two minutes. Okay, let's go. We're talking about the influences that we're choosing. Guys, yes, Shabbat. And no, nobody here should test this OG gangster. <laughs> <laughs> guys, let's, let's talk about this, okay? Let's just reason with this about a minute. You see, we're living in a society where there's influences coming to us. Things are happening around us that are making us move this way and move that way. If we don't choose our own path, hey guys, stop that now, come on. Guys, if we don't choose our own path, if we don't choose our own development, if we don't choose our own character development, and who's going to do it for us? The people are here. We have a big problem if we're allowing other people to decide for us who we are and what we're going to do. It's going to be a big issue. So, let us take time to review what it is we've decided is a better thing than what they had. Let's look at what they had, and then we want to compare it to what we have. Okay? Let's look what they have. The best that they ever had was in 1958, many years ago, many, almost 50 years ago, they're saying what? Family, school, church, peers, and TV. That's the best they had. 
They're saying that those were the primary influences. After that, it starts dropping off. We come now and we can determine for ourselves that these are going to be our influences now and into the future. These are our influences. What are our influences, number one? Islam. Islam. Doing things the right way with taqwa. Is that right? Yes. yes. Then we have what? Family. Respecting your family means you're respecting yourself. Is that right? Yes. Right. Now we have school. School, we need education so that we can go and live and be able to be successful in what we're doing. Have right? And have scholarship and be able to teach others. We have, we can teach others. And then we want to talk about friends. We want to pick the best friends. The friends that are going to remind us about Allah and remind us about our practice of Islam. Those are the friends you want around you. If you have friends who are not around you like that, you have a problem. You have a big difficulty. Don't make it difficult for yourself. Find friends that are going to remind you about Allah and His Messenger and about practicing religion. You'll be in a better situation, I guarantee you. I want to give you three pieces of advice from the brothers who are in jail. Three. And I told this many times and I'm probably going to tell it many times more. It's not finished because I don't think it could ever get done. The guys in jail, back in 1994, they tell us three things we should tell you. 94. Here's the three things. Please, pay attention. It's very important. Right? Here's the thing. Number one thing they say. You should have fear of Allah. They tell you, Itaqillah. Itaqillah mastatatu. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. Don't look at the next man and judge him. He may have his difficulties and challenges. Judge your own circumstance of how you're fearing Allah. Number one. Number two, listen to your mother and your father. Listen to your family. And listen to what they're saying that's going to help you improve yourself, improve your condition as a Muslim. Do that. It's, it's crucial. You have to do that. And you have to listen to the people. We have sheikhs in this masjid. We have imams in this masjid. We have people who are hafiz of Quran. We have people who are sincere, good people, Muslims. And they will help you solve your problem with Islam. Why are you looking somewhere else? Look at Islam and you'll find a solution. Islam is a solution to any problem. You just have to apply it. Number three, and I repeat to you. Do not, I repeat, do not take the kafirs to be your close friends. Don't do it. The majority of guys who are getting into trouble, who are going to jail and are getting themselves in a big problem, this is what they've done. They've come now to take the kafirs and let the kafirs be close to them and let the kafirs come now to do what? To make them have an influence over them. So when it came time, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Four days ago, four days ago, sister calls me up. She's out by Scarborough. And her son, her son was sitting close by his house. And one of his friends, his longtime friend, they grew up together from young kids. His friend come to him and give him a bike. Give him a bike. Say, listen, hang on to this for me. I got to go make a run and go do something. So the kid has got his friend, right? So what did he say? Yeah, no problem, man. Give me the bike. He held on to the bike. Five minutes later, the SWAT team come in, and guess what they do? They arrest everybody. Guess what was in the bike? A loaded gun and some cocaine. The guy's in the jail right over the street over here. Right over the street over here. Right there. He's in the jail right there now. Why? He have a loaded gun, and he have a bunch of cocaine. Did it belong to him? No. No? Did they set him up? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But he set himself up by doing what? By picking the wrong friends. This guy who gave it to him was a kafir. And he knew that this guy was into drugs. He knew that this guy was into guns. He knew that this guy was not a good person. And he took from him and he put himself in that position. So, guess what? We're now back to the line. You remember the line we started with? What do we start? So what's he doing? He's over there blaming. Oh, it's this guy's fault. It's this guy's fault. Who told him to take the package? No. Whose responsibility is it for now his condition? Yes. It's his. So what should he do? Learn. He should learn, right? So he might have to pay a heavy price now. He may have to go to jail for many years. We don't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But here's a lesson for you. Don't take bags from people who you know are doing dirt. Let's just be real. If you know something is not right, don't go ahead and go and put yourself in that situation. You see? So we have to talk to you like that. Number one, have taqwa. Have fear of Allah. Number two, listen to your mother, your father, and the people who love you and want to care for you. I'd rather talk to you here in the masjid than to go talk to you in the jail. Or go talk to you in your homes when your parents are saying, look, we're going to kick them out. We took some guys to the homeless shelter. Wallahi, we took some guys to the homeless shelter downtown at, at, uh, um, at uh, um, uh, what's called George Street. It's at uh, Jarvis and Dundas. It's called the place called Seaton House. And we have a thing, we have what's called the social awareness tour. We have one young brother, and guess what? He's 14 years old, and he pushes that down. We're not advertising his sin, but we're advising you that this thing happened. He pushes that down, and his father called and said, Listen, that's it. We've got to kick him out. He's 14. 
He doesn't want him to stay in the house anymore. Big problem. So we take him around and we go now to five places. How many places? Five. five. We went to the first place. You know where we stopped the first place? <laughs> Graveyard. Get out. His knees were shaking like this. He said, brother, what are we doing here? Brother, what are you going to do over here? Brother, he's going to... I said, no, no, don't worry, man. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not some kind of sadistic guy. I'm going to go crazy. No. I said, listen to what... Understand something. Today, you walk with me to the graveyard and you get to walk back. We just want to have a discussion. But someday, the people are going to walk with you in here and they're going to leave you here. You're not coming out. You're not leaving. So, you want to have good deeds or bad deeds? Good deeds. That's what he said too. We said, okay, then we need to talk. And we talked for half an hour outside, freezing cold. Half an hour we're talking, so he's ready now, okay? So now we go to the second place. Where are we going? Second place. We go right to the jail. Why? Because if he continued this behavior of violence and destruction like this, where does he end up? Jail. He ends up in jail. Everybody knows that. He even knows that. But he wasn't thinking about that. He just get emotional. He just get violent. He's just thinking with that instinctual, animalistic thing. He's not thinking at all. He's just acting. Okay? So, we take him to the jail. The guard comes out and the guard tells him, listen, if you go to jail, a young boy like you, they're going to abuse you. You know what I mean? You understand what I'm talking? They will abuse you. They will take you and they will turn you into a woman. I know we joke like that, we laugh and think it's funny, but it's not funny for him. It's not funny. And the guard is telling him, don't think it's funny. It's not any kind of joke. Okay? So here's the thing. The guard is telling him, not me. I'm not telling him. I could tell him the same thing. He doesn't have to listen. This guy is working there for 20 years and telling him, we've seen it happen too many times. We can't stop it. It happens. Hmm? So, we go now, third place. Where we go? To the homeless shelter. In the homeless shelter, we take him on a tour. We go now into the homeless shelter and there's a downstairs lounge where they have the washroom. In the washroom, they have four sinks, they have four toilets, and they have four urinals where you can stand up and go to the washroom. In those places, you know how many people are using it? 600. 600 people, many of them who have disease, tuberculosis, meningitis, all kinds of AIDS, all kinds of different disease, syphilis, gonorrhea, all kinds of unbelievable diseases going on, and you have to use the same sink and toilet as those people. And many of them, they don't even wash. It's horrible. When we opened up the door in the washroom, the stink that came out was enough to knock your knees shake. It was so bad we could hardly stand it. We have to move back. You see? So we say to the people, you want to come here? No. So now the fourth place we take him, where do we take him? The mental institution. When you put too much pressure on yourself, when you continue to do the bad deeds, what happens is you can snap. Just like that. You can snap. Mentally you go snap and they put you in this place. You know what? They give you drugs in this place that never allow you to come back to yourself. Ever. Whoever you are right now, you'll forget that person. It's gone. You finish. What do you have? One minute? Finish? Bands over? Okay. Zaklukai. Um, so, we take him. Okay. I give you four places. Where did I take you? To the, uh, to the graveyard? To the jail? Homeless shelter? To the uh, mental institution? Where's the fifth place we take him? To the masjid. We brought him to the masjid. And we tell him, this is where you get yourself straight. This is where you make all the things right. And alhamdulillah, the brother told me before he went home, he said, brother, you don't have to worry about me anymore. I understand. His family called me three days later and said, Brother, whatever you did, it worked because he's now changed. He's a better guy. He's more manners. He has more behavior. He's a good condition. So we tell you that so we don't have to take you on this trip. And we thank you for your time today. Jazakallah kulli kairin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.